Anyone want to raise a, a problem or an issue that you'd like to discuss? Yes, sir. Um, this is a little off topic, but I'm very curious. I once gave a speech not anywhere near as good as you are, celebrating Milton Friedman, trying to get the audience to understand and accept him and handle it over at the end. And the guy said, Bill Friedman is a socialist. And he said, he's been called a lot of things, but that's a new one to me. What do you mean? He didn't support the gold standard. You know, he didn't. What would he or you say to Ron Paul today, who is sort of the leading libertarian out there, about his idea of going back to the world state? Um, it's a somewhat complicated question. Um, and I might step on a couple toes. I think the gold is a superior foundation for a monetary system to what we have now which Milton Friedman warned us about. First monetary system in all of human history, totally unconnected to any non-elastic monetary base. So when the connection to gold was severed, when Nixon closed the gold window, Milton Friedman said, we are now entering uncharted waters. There's no historical experience for this. And I don't think it's turned out all that well. That's a concept uh, when you look back on it. Friedman was in favor of a market for monies. And in fact, later in life, he said, yes, I don't think you need to have a state monopoly on currency. You could have competitive currencies. He did not think that he knew what would be the best monetary base, gold, silver, basket of commodities, or something else. And he favored free banking, which is to say a more radical position, if you will, if you will than those who favor a 100% gold-backed dollar, which is the sort of thing that Ron Paul has advocated. So I think that would be better to link the dollar to gold than what we have now. It's not linked to anything. It's just a matter of arbitrary whim of the central, uh, of the authorities of the, of the central bank. And having some non-elastic or relatively non-elastic monetary base would be an improvement. But I think Friedman's perspective was that question should also be left up to the market. Um, he also was concerned, and it's a somewhat technical matter, about the possibility of an appreciating monetary unit, appreciating in value, meaning that would, it would cause difficulties for people to make investments in the future. Remember our discussion of the loan. So let's say that I borrow $100. The money I'm going to pay back if it's denominated solely in gold, if the gold is appreciating in value, it automatically is worth more when I give it back. If there's an additional positive interest rate on top of that, it means if the, if the monetary base gold is, in, is in already increasing 5%, and there's a 5% interest rate on top of that, it's a super normal. His concern was if you would end up generating negative interest rates in nominal terms, what would that mean for economic calculation? And he thought that the market could come up with a better system than a non-elastic gold-based money. That's a somewhat complicated issue. But he agreed that money should not be subject to political manipulation. He saw that as a terrible, terrible danger. And he identified the Federal Reserve as fundamentally the biggest cause of the Great Depression because they allowed a, over one-third contraction of the monetary supply in a very short period of time. It was a massive initial deflation. And that was a very serious problem. Uh, his solution, he struggled at various times, was to say, well, maybe you should just have a monetary rule. If you're going to have a monetary authority, set them that they can only increase the money supply by some set amount per year of the monetary base. And later in life, he saw that wasn't working too well either. And he said free banking was a, a preferable alternative. That's a, it's a complicated matter, one of the more technical economic, uh, elements of economics. Yes, sir. So it seems as though you're kind of pinning a lot of our current economic woes on, on Freddie and Fannie and, and some of this. Oh. Why did you disregard, say, the um, collusion between ratings agencies and banks and rating tranches as AAA, right. uh, the impact of CDSs and CDOs, which are pretty obscure right. uh, and opaque? So you can't tell what's in them. They're incredibly complex machinations of a, what's 
essentially a deregulated banking industry? Not quite. In fact, that, that's one of the interesting questions. Was it deregulation? One of my colleagues, Mark Calabria, looked at that. Was the banking and financial industry generally deregulated? By any objective measure, it wasn't, insofar as page numbers in the Federal Register of additional new regulations increased, budgets of all regulatory agencies increased, and numbers of staff increased. In what sense was there a deregulation of the financial services industry? Indeed, one of the issues about the ratings is a very important point. I, I could have given a whole talk on that. I really wanted to give it a little slice. Was that the SEC established an uh, oligopoly of ratings agencies. There was not a free market in ratings agencies. So there was only Standards and Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch Correct. were allowed to issue these ratings. So that if you came along and issued another rating based on your examination of the books, it just didn't matter. It, it could not be it could not be legally even discussed, in effect. So you had an oligopolistic system. And then a very serious principal agent problem in terms of the structuring of the financial services industry. And this is one that is not entirely due to just state intervention, but it is a, a possible corollary of the oligop oligopoly that was created by SEC regulations. And that is to say that the person who paid for the rating was the issuer of the security, not the purchaser. Well, that is a big problem right there. We have what's called a principal agent problem. Uh, it turns out I want to buy something from Mr. Hollenbeck, and the agency that tells you how good it is, like this camera, says it's great, and he's the one who pays the agency. Which is intuitively obvious that there's going to be a problem uh, in that situation. And then there were other principal agent problems that permeated the whole mortgage, um, the brokerage market. Again, because people had an incentive to make you qualify, fudge the numbers a little bit so that you can qualify. The question, though, is acknowledging those as also problems that contributed. What was driving this flood of cash that was going into these kinds of securities and derivatives markets? It was the, the demand for AAA rated things for pensions and well, countries. there's always a demand for AAA as opposed to something else. It was, it was huge, and that was driving the, the interest on the, the ninja loans and, and the prerequisites as you used up all your right. healthy borrowers. Once that was tapped out, the demand for those AAA ratings was still incredibly high. There's no question about that. So that drove down, the banks drove down right. requirements, wasn't it? Be careful on that, because we, the question is, some banks did and some didn't. BB&T and Wells Fargo didn't. Now we have a system which they have been officially punished by the Treasury Department and forced into the TARP system, which they did not want to be in. Right? We had a whole mentality in which it was made very clear, too big to fail. And every major agency had a big incentive to become so big that they would not be allowed to fail. This was part of the very perverse incentives that permeated the entire world financial system. We had also other problems. I, I had up there, but didn't mention the Bank for International Settlements, the so-called Basel Accords. That's a very good example, in my opinion, of a failed regulation. We were told that the Basel Accords were there to guarantee the stability of the international financial system, by which we'd have to say, not very successful, given what happened afterwards. What did the Basel Accords do? They established um, ratings that were authoritative and were then implemented by national regulatory bodies as legal requirements, country after country, that establish capital requirements for banks, so just to make it not very technical. Banks like to loan out all the funds they have because they get interest on them. They need to have some capital, more or less cash in the till or various kinds of liquid assets, if people come in and redeem those, right? Say, I want my money. You go to the bank, everyone went to the bank tomorrow, they wouldn't have enough cash on hand to pay all of us as depositors. But they have to have enough for those they anticipate are likely to come in. So they set capital requirements. A bank looks at this and says, well, okay, but I'm losing money. I could be loaning that money out. Right? They set different categories of risk and zero risk assets against which there were no capital requirements were um, Sovereign debt. Sovereign debt. 
And uh, let me translate sovereign debt, what that means. Greek government bonds is what that means. Those are rated zero risk. So banks were given huge incentives because it freed up all their capital requirements to loan out, which generates uh, interest or income for the bank, to load up on uh, crappy debt, government debt, Greek bond. That's why the German government ended up bailing out the Greek government. They were really bailing out Hupo Vereinsbank, one of the biggest German banks, that had massive uh, uh, Greek debt. And then the second least risky category were government guaranteed mortgage-backed securities. Turned out it was those ninja loans. And the tranche that had been set up by, this is a little technical, by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they took all of these mortgages, anything that generates a revenue stream has a present value. Right? The sum of all the future revenue discounted by the interest rate is the present value of the asset. So they took all these together, stuck them in a big bag, shook them all up, and then issue tranches with different ratings. It's very complicated and spooky. That had to do with which one would be paid off with priority, right? The top of the of the sausage, if you will, going all the way down to the one would be the last ones to be paid off. The consequence was effective elimination of markets for risk in this context. There was no effective market for people to be able to evaluate risk under this system. So the securitization system, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are government agencies, not private. They were semi-privatized and the stock was issued, but they're government-sponsored enterprises with a line of treasury, of credit at the Treasury of the United States of America, and all kinds of privileges. They dominated the whole home finance market to the point they had three quarters of home mortgages were in these two government agencies. This is not healthy. It was not a market. And the consequence was, Everyone speeding along saying, isn't it great we've eliminated risk, we have these clever mathematical models. And then we have just a gigantic, a catastrophic uh, financial well, system. They're faulty models. models. Sorry? They're faulty models. Faulty models, but I think the hubris of having those models in the first place and then in effect having a close to monopolistic control over the whole mortgage market home mortgage market, also commercial mortgages, through two government-sponsored enterprises. This is not a market experience. And so that, that's my fundamental point. You're correct to point out, well, it's a complicated story of a usually, cascade. Usually com complicated cascade, and that's not addressing CEOs Which is Credit default obligations are also complex. Not inherently destabilizing, in my opinion, though, because you can have hedges and swaps that can generate more stability in the market. These were so non-transparent, though, that they generated all kinds of problems. Well, they're insurance. Yes, but, but it's not inherently not a destabilizing the future. Um, let, me, let me do wrap that up, though. You will have periodic failures of firms in any market. In fact, that's a sign of a healthy market. A market where no firm ever failed. Something is goofy about that. Having these cascades of the sort that we had, I would venture to say you had to have had state intervention that occluded risk and stopped the market process from functioning to bring about this giant crash. And in the absence of those state interventions, you would have had ongoing rolling failures that would have generated market feedback. And instead we got a gigantic financial system. But it, it's a complicated